Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining for joining me and giving giving up an, an hour or so of your of your evening. I'll try and make it worthwhile. Um, <clears throat> um, I my my knowledge comes from partly from academia, so I <clears throat> partly from practice. Um, I have been a corporate, an internal, an independent, and a uh, I'm, I'm now a consultant to the consulting industry, if that makes sense. Um, and, and partly from my, my research most recently into firms that grow in order to sell. Um, and obviously, the bigger you are, the more resources you can throw at digital marketing. Um, and I'm not making any recommendations here that will require anyone to break the bank. Um, most consultancy 72 percent of consultancies say their biggest challenge is attracting new clients and even if you are attracting new clients i would say that attracting more clients is always a good thing because it's an it's it's the way that you put can put your prices up and you can work with better people and you can have easier clients and you can drop those clients that are a complete pain in the backside to work with um so e even if your pipeline is full and i hope it is um uh, but gen generally, it's not, of course. Um, even if the pipeline is full, it's a good thing to to still focus on marketing because it's uh, it, it allows you to do better consultancy, work with better people, improve your knowledge, and increase your margin. So it's, it's it's generally a good thing to do. And certainly, if you're planning on growing your consultancy, um, it's crucial because, as a few of you will have experienced, typically after two years your friends and family and ex-colleagues dry up. And if you're lucky, they don't. Um, and when those dry up, you're in this peculiar situation where, you know, you've had money in the bank, you've had stable, um, a stable pipeline, and all of a sudden it's looking shaky. And the last, the last year has, I suppose, really emphasised that for pretty much all of us. It's, it's been a tough year for, you know, in my view, around 85% of consultancies. There's a, there's a small percentage that um, have, have actually done quite well out of COVID, but most, most of us haven't. Um, so, so this is really the basis of my, of my talk, is really reflecting on what I have seen work um, what seems to work. I'm not a marketing expert, and that's good in some ways, I, th I think, because two things. One, I'm going to keep it practical and focused on what works. And number two, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, I could be wrong, but my, my interpretation of why so much marketing material is quite high level is that they, they want you to go and you know, buy ten thousand pounds worth of marketing consultancy, and you know, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad investment, but I I can't see why a lot of this can't be done much cheaper. Um, because shall I shall I carry on, or do you have um do you have other things? Shall I shall I launch into the presentation? Well, I think you know just to just to kick you off there, you. Joe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, what does good digital marketing look like? Anyway, well, it is it's getting it's getting a, a pipeline of of people that you want to work with and will pay you the money that you you think you deserve, or maybe not all the money that you think you deserve, um, but at least are paying decent rates. Um, there's we all know there's a lot of clients out there who who you know who you don't particularly want to work with, and if you've managed to get rid of them, fantastic. But you can only get rid of them if you can replace them with be with better clients, or you can manage them better, or whatever. Um, so in, in my view, good, good marketing full stop, whether it's digital or paper or face to face, um, allows you to turn a, a group of great prospects into a group of great qualified leads so that your sales process can convert them and allow you to have some great clients. It sounds like a good time now to turn to your presentation. Joe. Okay, so please do. <laughs> Thank you. Tell us more about all that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I've, I, I, this is the first time I've, I've I've put this presentation together, and it's it's aesthetically it's not beautiful. There's a lot of green in there, but I, I really hope it gets across some of the key things that I that I want to talk about. Um, 
and and there's some there's some quite useful tricks that um i would hope not hope i'd be surprised if all of you knew all of them or even if one of you knew all of them if you do i'm happy to refund the cost of entry um okay let's share the screen digital marketing 101 hopefully you can all see that um now as i said before i am aware that i might i might be standing on mount stupid um feel free to put questions into chat by by the way um i um, i'll probably save them all till later because we've got a q a session later um this i show my mba students because mba students as you might know are very keen on giving very confident advice as soon as they get their qualification and i do warn them that if they're going to be consultants they might be standing on mount stupid but i i do also realize that there are there are other mount stupids that are just bigger and so whilst I used to be completely ignorant about uh, about digital marketing, um, and now I think I'm not necessarily entirely ignorant, I may be standing on another mountain. And there's certainly, you know, I work with a guy called Martin Williams, who, you know, all he does is digital marketing, and he's been doing that for 15 years. And, um, and you know, he, he, he charges a lot of money uh, for... For, for what he does but what i'm not trying to do is do the type of marketing that you might see at mckinsey or you know or or even a medium-sized consultancy i'm talking about firms that typically have fewer than 20 people and maybe only have one person in them so what am i going to talk about um three things really and i'm not going to separate them too much but number one, how we go about finding prospects, how we go about finding the right people who could be our clients. Um, number two, creating leads. How do we turn that pool of people into people who know about us and think about us in the right way? And when I say think about us in the right way, I like the phrase of visible expert. I think all consultants should aspire to become visible experts. And that's the, the, those are two separate words, obviously. And the visible, you know, obviously you need to be an expert, but you need to show that you're an expert. And you also need to be seen by enough people to recognize you as an expert. There's no point being an expert if you're hiding your light under a bushel. And there's no point shouting to the world about how wonderful you are if nobody knows. Um, sorry, if you're not an expert, because you'll get found out. Um, and then finally, talking about a marketing system, um, I'm going to keep it pretty basic. Um, you know, I'm 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 I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not a, a, a technophile, um, but, and I won't be recommending anything that I haven't done myself. Um, so we will kick off there. So this is what um, <coughs> we'll we'll be mostly focusing on, and it is how to attract people to you. There's another process, which is once you've attracted people to you, how do you convert them? But what I want to stress here is that in, in my work with my own clients, where I add, where I believe I add the most value is not on the marketing side of things, but is further up the value chain. And I would say you can do all the marketing in the world on an OK service or an OK niche. I would say that most consultancies, and I'd say, I'd say eighty percent of the of the start of the of the consultancies that I work with, are better off spending their time thinking about exactly who their market is, and what they are offering them. And I think really getting focused on that and taking that seriously, and not taking it for granted simply because it's what you've done in the past, or it's simply because what you're good at. Or it's simply because you know you like doing it. Of course, those things are all important, but there's a natural ceiling on the on both the amount of clients you can get and the prices that you can charge. If you are doing, um, uh, I don't know, change change. You know, um, let's say let's say change management training in the public sector. There's a fairly low ceiling on what you can charge, give or take. If you are doing a uh, change strategy in the finance sector, which isn't a million miles away, um, there's a much higher ceiling. It's two or three times the, the, the day rate that you can charge. So I would always say it's worth taking very, very seriously um, the strategy. You know, what do you want to do with your firm? Uh, you know, 
do you want to exit? Do you want to sell it? How much revenue is, is enough? How hard do you want to work? Do you want to work a three day week or do you want to work a six day week in order to achieve those goals? Your services, you know, obviously what you're selling um, and, and your niche. And this is before you get to the marketing. And the niche here is quite crucial. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second, but because typically what you have in marketing, and this is really what we'll be focusing on here, is you need to find prospects. And once you've found them, you need to educate them as to why, number one, they have a problem, and number two, uh, your solution can fix that problem or opportunity. You can frame any problem as an opportunity. And then as a result of that, you have qualified leads. And prior to all of this, you have that niche area and you would push in the buyer profile. So once you've got a very clear understanding of your buyer profile, again, something worth spending a lot of time on, even if you think you know that. Then you've got the marketing process or the attraction process. And then you've got the conversion process and the conversion process is the sales process. And I, you know, I obviously think, you know, people can do work on that, but really I wanted to get across that we're talking, we're talking about, um, you know, we're talking about one part, a very important part, but one part of what makes a good consultancy. Um, right. So let's, uh, let's go into a little bit more detail here. Okay. So finding prospects, how do we do it? Okay, so roughly speaking, and I, I don't like to use military metaphors, but I'm using a military metaphor here. There's, there's two rough ways. One is a highly targeted way. Um, and this is where you as a person will be involved a lot more. Um, and you, it's more likely to be face to face or trying to get people. And so typically what you'd start off with, and this is what I would ask my clients is, uh, who would you be your 10 best clients? And within those clients, who would be the best buyer? And OK, once you've got a list of those, what are they responsive to? What are those buyers like? What are their personalities like? Where do they go? What groups are they part of? Who do they listen to? We'll talk about how you find out that information later um, and within those clients when do they buy some consultancies um, their clients have a specific trigger so it might be coming up to a merger an acquisition it might be a type of technology implementation it might be a new leader um, et cetera et cetera and you can you can do scans you can set up alerts to find for these for these few companies you can set up alerts or indeed pay someone to do a LinkedIn search for you. Um, so that you've got a very targeted campaign and you're writing personalized emails and you're sending personalized high value contents to these people. And, you know, that that's uh, that's important. You know, if you're at a conference or if you're at some type of industry forum, then, you know, you might uh, you might try and find some of these people who are there. Um, the the some people would frame it as an alternative, but I don't see it as such. Um, it's more of the shotgun approach. So above you have a sniper approach. And this is more of a shotgun approach, what some consultants call spray and pray. Um, and this is much more automated, uh, less of your personal time dealing with individuals or tailoring your specific message for individuals. And you're much more likely to have some form of automation happening here. And you'll, you'll, your inboxes will be full of these automated newsletters that go out, uh, LinkedIn messages that are going out, email lists, um, and also doing SEO on your website. And this is something that I'd like to emphasize quite early on. Most people, <laughs> most, most of my clients and most people I speak to, I do a lot of advice through the university to small firms. They always score, they will tell, I'll ask them to score their website. And they'll typically score it sort of six or seven out of 10, between five and seven out of 10. It's, I, I very rarely come across anyone that I would score above six out of 10, unless they're in a larger company. Um, and again, it doesn't need to be expensive, but it needs to be very much tailored to the client's problems. The method, so very often you'll come across a website and it's all about the consultant, who they are, how long they've been in the business, rather than the client problems that they're solving. Um, and the other thing I would emphasize is that I, I used to be quite anti-SEO. Uh, SEO, for those of you that don't know, is search engine optimization. And it's the ability for when, 
when someone uh, types in the keywords into Google, that would typically take them to you, it's ensuring that you are on the first page. Um, and it's actually a relatively complicated science. Fortunately, you can outsource this. For those of you that don't use it already, um, I've been using Fiverr, which is um, a, a website where you can hire experts in uh, much cheaper countries to do work for you. I was saying to Nick just before this, I have a development team in Pakistan who are as good, if not better, than any British uh, team that I've worked with, but they're about a, they're about a, a quarter of the price. Um, and I've got them to do my SEO and it's had an incredible effect. So that if anyone types in the keywords um, that, uh, that I've given them, um, I'm on the first page in Google. So it's worth, it's worth thinking about. I'll talk more about these in a little bit more detail, but really what I wanted to do at this stage is to talk, is to say it's worth, consultancies traditionally have done the targeted stuff very well. You know, partners have gone out and shook the hands and, uh, and, and done the dinners and done the golf uh, for the targeted stuff. But consultancy traditionally has seen um, mass digital marketing as almost a dirty thing. And some of my own clients, when I talk to them about this, they get a little bit uncomfortable and my answer to them is always the same. And that is, if you believe that you, your work is genuinely benefiting your client, then I would say you almost have a moral duty to let people know about it. Now, you know, if you're selling something dodgy or you're selling something that you don't believe in or you don't think it works, then by all means, take the moral low ground and say, well, I'm not going to, the moral high ground and say, well, I'm not going to do this. But if you have something that you do believe in and you do think works and you think is better the than the competitors, then I would say there's no reason why you shouldn't be looking at automation as a possibility. I go into this in a little bit more detail later. I've just got a few chats. I'd like, Nick says, I'd like spray and pray to be outlawed. I, I agree with you when it's, when it's done badly. Um, and all of us will have been victims of, done, of, of badly done spray and pray, uh, uh, you know, on, on LinkedIn, on your LinkedIn messages or your email spam will be full of those types of things. Um, but to give you an example, I don't know if you can see my wall over there, but that's my, um, that's my client list at the moment. Um, I used to ask for referrals. Um, from my clients and I, I don't do that anymore and one of the reasons I don't do that is I have a button that gets me clients I'll tell you more about that button later but I press it and it sends a short video um, and a personalized email or sorry a personalized message on LinkedIn to 100 people a week and within that week I will typically get three people who will contact me and ask for a meeting and one of those people will typically take me on as a client. So if I, if I see now, if I'm looking at December, my clients start to dip a little bit. And in January, they go down fairly significantly. Sometime in November, I will press the button and I will typically have that button running for a couple of weeks and it should do its job. Um, now, the video I send people is... Um, the problem it's about the problem that I solve, which is growth in small consulting firms. Um, and I send it to founders of small consulting firms um, that have grown from two to 10 people in the last two years. And we'll talk about search, search terms later. So, you know, I, th I think it's offering value to them, even if they never pick up the phone to me. Um, and I have, you know, confidence in what I do that it does add value. Because if you if you don't, then why are you in the business in the first bit, in in the first place? So it can be done badly, but it can be done well. And when it's done well, you're offering free value to people. You should be offering free value to people. Um. Anyway, okay, let's let's keep moving on. So I'm going to show you. Um, what are the automated LinkedIn outreach show? I'll talk, I'll talk about that shortly, Luca. Nice to see you on the call, Luca. Um, so I loosely, and this, it very much depends on the consultancy and it very much depends upon what you're selling, but I've loosely split up the different methods of outreach, of marketing, um, 
into things that have a higher success rate versus low success rate and things that are expensive versus cheap. So let's look at the high success, relatively cheap ways of getting people. So top, and this, this is all based, this is all based, uh, it's mostly based on stats um, and surveys that I've done and other people have done, and it's partly based on experience. Um, the, the most successful way of getting new clients is, or, or getting new business is number one, to expand business with existing clients, and number two, to use referrals systematically to get new clients. And those are consistently shown in the, in the literature and in my experience to be the best ways of getting new clients. So it's, you know, it's old school. It's not digital. Um, it's old school conversations and referrals based on trust. Um, and a lot of the other stuff here is much more person based. I've written hanging out there. Um, and the reason <laughs> the reason I've done that is because um, a, a few of the consultancies that successfully grew and sold um, described different forms of hanging out as quite crucial to their growth. I'll give you one example. And that was a firm that grew from two partners to 55 consultants and sold for 22 million last year. And um, one of the partners said he got most of his business by going to uh, the business lounge at airports and working there all day and making sure that when he went, when he had a coffee, that when he sat beside someone, or when he, you know, whenever he was up and about, he got talking to people um, and he met most of his clients there. Um, and I thought, well, that's fantastic. And there are lots of other examples like that. I didn't know what to call it. So I've called it hanging out. But other relatively successful cheap ways are doing webinars, being a conference speaker, being an award winner. A couple of consultancies that I studied um, put their very early success down to winning awards. And that allowed them to introduce themselves to lots of clients. They put it up on their website and they did a big speech at the, uh, at the award ceremony where there were lots of clients in the audience. And that, they said, kept them going for, for two to three years. Um, giving talks at professional associations, this, I guess, would be categorised as one of those. And I believe one of the most effective ways of marketing, and in my experience, this certainly worked for me, is to do a benchmarking report. I'll give you an example from from my own work. So um, a few years ago, I was asked to lead a project um, funded by the UK government into innovation in consulting. And I did loads of interviews and case studies and reading and all the rest of it. And right at the end, I thought, well, I've got a whole load of hypotheses. I'm going to create a survey. So I sent the survey out, about 250 people replied about what they linked to innovation in their consultancies. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. So I, I, I did a nice infographic, created a report, and then um, allowed it for down, download. And then I thought, well, it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's not expensive to create a benchmarking tool from this. So I spent a couple of grand creating a, a benchmarking tool that allowed people to put in the answers to the questions I asked, and it would bench, benchmark them against the data that was already in the database. Now, this was fantastic. Now, I wasn't particularly interested in consultancy, you know, my own consultancy at the time. So I didn't make the most of it. But what happened, obviously, was that people were putting in their data and it was saying that, you know, you scored high in this area, but you scored badly in this area. And my phone rang off the hook for a long time with people saying, hey, look, I've just filled out this uh, this survey. Um, the report says I'm scoring badly in this area. Can you help me improve? Now, sadly, my answer at the time was, well, no, I can't actually, because I'm more interested in academia than consultancy. But you'll notice um, as the cost of creating benchmarking uh, tools has collapsed over the last 10 years, and more and more people are offering that. And it's, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's not cheap, um, but it's a very effective way if you can find, you know, if you can find the right, the, the right area. With all of this, it does depend on the consultancy and it depends on the person themselves, you know, what you like doing, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, now, I'm also going to introduce 
the ones that have a very low success rate but are cheap. Now, a low success rate, if it's cheap, isn't necessarily a problem. Uh, something like automated LinkedIn <coughs> outreach, or even writing, you know, writing a blog. This is slightly more expensive in terms of time and effort. Um, uh, it's it's there, you know, a blog one, a blog post once it's there, if it's written properly, it should be evergreen, in that the content is there forever. And if you could do good SEO on a blog post, um, it can turn up in people's uh, ser searches um, for the next five years. Um, and so all of, all of the stuff that I've put in the cheap but expensive are things that I would say are worth considering. What I would say isn't worth considering, oh, actually, I caveat this, as I said before, it does depend on the consultancy. I have seen sponsorship work. I have seen pay-per-click ads work, and I have even see, seen cold calling work, you know, actually PA consulting uh, when, it, when it started. I can't remember what it was called, but they did a huge amount of cold calling to great success, but they did it strategically and systematically, and they did, got great people to do it. However, generally speaking, I would say that these are relatively expensive forms of, um, of uh, marketing and often have low success rates. The two outliers here, I would say, are entirely dependent on your personality. Um, that is creating a podcast and publishing books. Some people love doing podcasts and some people love writing books. I love writing books. I've written four books um, and I've published probably getting on for 100 articles. I love doing it. Um, and also it's part of my job as a professor to do it. And so for me, book publishing works and I've had probably more leads off my books than anything else. Um, and podcasts are the same. You know, they're, they're a fair amount of work. You know, the last the, the book I've written that's coming out in January on growing consulting firms, you know, it's 100,000 words and it took me probably two years to, uh, to, to get it done. Um, a podcast is also a labor of love, um, but it does very much depend on, you know, depend on you, your personality, what you like doing. The, another great thing about podcasts like blogs is that they're relatively evergreen. And by evergreen, I mean, it's content that doesn't go out of date and is, you know, probably for the next 10 years going to be relevant. And so later on, I will encourage you uh, to, to, to look at evergreen, ever, to, to produce evergreen content rather than content that is not particularly relevant in six months time. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about when talking about finding prospects is LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And I gave you an example earlier of how specific my search terms can be. And I don't think most people, think Sales Navigator is, isn't cheap. It's around, I think it's 65 quid a month. Um, and of course, you can do a lot on LinkedIn without Sales Navigator. Um, but if you have access to Sales Navigator, you can give it queries like this. Find me all Deloitte alumni who are directors and have an interest in leadership development. Find me all Oxford educated CEOs whose companies have shrunk over the last year and who live in London. Find me chief marketing officers in French medium sized manufacturing firms that have been in the role for less than six months and who have a team of between 10 and 100 people. Now that is laser targeted. So what when I talk about automated emails or automated LinkedIn messaging, what I'm what I definitely wouldn't encourage is anyone to send out mass emails to anyone and their dog, because I think there is a moral question there which is that you're wasting thousands of people's time and it's not a particularly good use of your money but if you can be as laser focused as this then it's certainly worth thinking about um, again as i say you don't have to be on sales navigator to have some of these benefits um, but you know the ability to search um search companies by how much they've grown in the last few years or what the uh group membership the interests of the members are is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, now, here I'm going to give you a few tips um, on, on relatively cheap ways of finding prospects where you don't have to spend much money at all. So this is aside from LinkedIn. I wanted to mention the LinkedIn thing because I think most people don't realize how powerful it can be. 
um, I could do a whole session on LinkedIn, and maybe I will do that in, in, in a few months. Um, but but really, if, if you're not using it, and this, with all of this, and we'll talk about this when I talk about systems, there's no point doing this in a haphazard manner. Whatever you're going to do, I would say focus on one thing. Get that thing done well and done properly and systematically. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, you don't have an Instagram profile or Twitter and Facebook and all the rest of it. If you try and do more than one thing and you're a solo consultant, you're going to do that more than one thing probably badly. You know, in some, you can automate sharing, but it doesn't, doesn't always work. But I would say focus on one or two things, do them well. And once you've mastered those, only then look at other things. And when you're choosing those things, don't just think about what's most popular amongst your audience. Also think about how you come across, you know, best. Some people come across better in the written word. Some people come across better face to face. Other people come across better in Zoom. Anyway, three tips here. The Fame database, email lists, and LinkedIn automation. I've talked a bit about LinkedIn automation. I'll talk about it again. So Fame database. This is a database of all UK companies that is searchable by size, sector, growth, sick code, um, and all ownership and lot, many, many other variables. And the good thing about the size thing is that you can see firms that are growing. And when I say size, it can be number of employees, it can be margins, it can be revenue. It will also give you alerts if any of these companies look like they're going to be taken over for those of you interested in mergers and acquisitions. This will typically cost you between 5,000 and 1 million, depending on the size of company. However, I'd like to introduce you to Claire. Now, Claire is a student at your local business school, and most students have access to this free of charge. So I would get in contact with your local business school and say, you know, when, when it's time for the marketing master's students to do their projects, you'd like to be considered. Or, you know, the MBA students always do a live project. Um, the business students do a live project at the end of their degree. Um, and they're, they're usually crying out for businesses to get involved with. In fact, I've just put, put a few of my students with some of my clients. So do try and, you know, uh, have, reach out and then you get access to this. And the first thing I say to my students who are going off to clients to do work is say, right, OK, find out what exactly what companies make the ideal clients for your for, for these firms and you know produce a database you know uh, pre create a database from the fame database that's number one the fame database number two is email lists in fact i'll, I'll deal with number two and number three uh together um again typically if you buy an email list off a marketing company it's going to be pretty it's going to mark you as spam straight away. So I'm always in favor of people actually going away and finding the specific emails for people that I want them to do rather than just buying an you know, email list that perhaps a thousand other people are using. Um, so the lady in that picture there is called Suma. Um, I use Suma to, find, to help my students get jobs because a lot of my students don't get into the McKinsey's, Baines and Boston's. And I'll say, well, you know, there's no, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, there's lots of boutique consultancies out there. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll ask um, Suma to find me, um, you know, I, the most recent one was a, funnily enough, a marketing student um, who wanted to work in media consultancy. Um, and so I got her to find, uh, the emails of CEOs in boutique marketing consultancies. Um, it cost me 20 pounds. And you can, you know, you can do this for any niche that you're particularly interested in. And, and the same is true of LinkedIn automation. Um, the best LinkedIn automator I have found is called Meet Alfred. Meet Alfred will send um, a personalized email that will say something like, um, hi Nick, I hope all is well at the CMCE. Um, I'm a specialist in organizing webinars uh, very cheaply and very reliably. Um, if my services are of any interest, do let me know. Um, and it, again, relatively cheap, and it has a whole CRM system behind it that you may or may not want to use. Again, it's not for everyone, but it's worth knowing about.
Joe, just a clarifying yeah, sure. question yep. um, about the email list. Is that uh, 20 pounds per time, per hour, per time? Oh, so she charges five, five pounds an hour um, and she's, she's good. So that, so, so, so that, those hundred emails that I got for that student, that cost me about 20 pounds. Um, but that was quite specific. I was, I was asking for, for very specific, um, uh, both in terms of geography, sector, service and size and so they're quite difficult to find um but you know if if you want something that's less specific um you know 10 10 pounds will get you will get you a fair number of of people's emails and it's also quite useful if you've got you know if you've got targeted clients that you want to have a conversation with and perhaps you bumped into them at a conference and you can't you know you didn't get their business card um, it can be quite useful for finding specific people. There was one person a while back that I really wanted. That was it. I was I was looking for the email of a firm that had been bought by another firm, uh, the CEO, and I I spent probably two or three hours trying to find the email. I couldn't find it, and I paid Suma five pounds. In fact, it was less than that. It was five dollars, um, and she went away and found it. Um, now you want to be very so when you haven't I, I, I can go into different amounts of detail but one thing i would say is that when you get an email list for those of you that do want to go down this line when you get an email list also pay someone five dollars to validate it um if you've got if you've got an email list of a thousand people and you put it into your crm system and you send out a newsletter to a thousand people then i'd say on average a good 15 percent of them will bounce back because they're old emails or they're, um, they're no longer working or the person's moved company or whatever, um, or the company's closed. But because that 15% have been knocked back, your email will be marked as a spammy email. And if you do that a few times over, hardly any of your email emails will get, to, will get through to prospects. So whenever you have an email list, it's worth paying. You can find someone on Fiverr who can do it quite easily. Um, pay them and it will cost you between five dollars and ten dollars and you pay them to test the emails and they will return you a spreadsheet with the only with the emails on it that work rather than the emails that don't and and just to clarify did you find suma through fiverr or was suma one of your students um i've spent i've spent a long time um finding good people on fiverr um you on on fiverr so she wasn't she wasn't one of my students i now use her privately actually she she's on fiverr but i don't like the way <clears throat> fiverr takes 15 percent of her pay so i pay her the same amount but i give it straight to her rather than to fiverr so um i've i spent about five years on on fiverr finding great people and it's taken me a while, but if anyone wants recommendations, I'm more than happy to fire over recommendations. If you drop me an email and say, look, Joe, some, I need someone who can, you know, either find emails or do graphic design or, you know, clean up a PowerPoint or proofread a book. I've got a list of around 40 people who I think are fantastic um, and work with them and trust them. Well, we may well be flooding your inbox very soon then, Joe. Sure. Just another uh, clarifying question. Um, you mentioned uh, search engine optimization in your yep. opening remarks. Are you yep. going to be speaking about that in your presentation? Um, I'm, I haven't got much on it, but but I, I can talk about it a little bit here if that's okay. Well, in terms of finding prospects, right? SEO. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah, so... Um, SEO is, it's one of those, how long is a piece of string? Um, search engine optimization will allow, um, if you're doing something relatively niche, um, there's no point trying to get ranked on the first page of Google for something like marketing or something like business transformation. Um, and this is why going back to why it's so important to have a very clear and distinctive niche and clear and distinctive offerings. And this has always been true, but it's especially true in the digital world because what you don't want to be doing is competing with KPMG on their marketing spend. Um, if, if you type it, you know, if someone types in digital transformation, they're going to get the, the, the biggest spenders who would typically be spending tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands on SEO work. 
However, one thing I would just really simple. One thing I would recommend you do is either have a blog or a podcast or just a page on your website that starts off with the question that your best client would type in in order to find you. Now, for me, that's how do you scale a consultancy to, to, to sell? Or how do you grow a consultancy to sell? And have that as the title of the page, have it as the URL, um, you know, whatever your domain is, then have it as the URL, and then answer the question. Um, and uh, then, you know, and just by having that, you're increasing the chances of somebody finding you via a search engine tremendously. Now, again, if that question is, how do I do business transformation? You're never going to rank. No, no, of course. Of but course. if that question is quite specific, um, then there's no reason why you can't be can't be ranked. Um, and you'll see you'll see quite a few small companies have managed to do this in the marketing realm. Um, so it's it's worth it's worth and good SEO. Lots of people, you know, pay a marketing agency to do SEO for them. So they'll create a website, create their blog, then they'll give it to them and say, go and do SEO on it. Now, that's fine, but it's much better to start off with SEO, uh, with content that is easy to do search engine optimization on. And that is content that speaks directly to your client as if you were having a conversation with them about their problems, different ways of describing those problems and your potential solutions to those. Um, and if you can write a few blog posts specifically about the problems or problems that you overcome or opportunities that you maximize, um, then that will really improve your ranking. And then pay someone to do SEO on them. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It will cost a couple of hundred pounds. Get someone to do SEO on them and it will make a huge difference to your ranking on Google or anything like that. That's really helpful, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm conscious of time, and oh, yes, I think yes. that you have two more topics you want to speak to okay, us about. Yes. <laughs> and there are some questions in the chat as well. So yep, sure. shall we okay. move on to the next topic? Yes, yes. Good idea. Okay, right. So thank you. Okay. So this is okay. So this is really about content. So we've done prospects, we've got a load of prospects. Um, people that are, are, you know, potentially interested in us. Now we need to educate them and build trust. And these are the two big things that all the evidence shows um, uh, create, trans, translates prospects into leads. Prospects are people that are interested in, uh, and, and, but this, this key thing here is building, building trust with them and educating them in, in how your solutions can fix their problems. Um, so this is really where digital content comes in. And if you're going to produce digital content, don't waste your time doing ad hoc stuff, you know, putting pictures up about your dog occasionally. Um, do, do work that is consistent. It's always got to be consistent and make it useful or make it educational or make it evidence based. And the key thing here is consistency. Uh, all the search engines, all the platforms reward consistency of content production. Um, I'll keep going. Um, in terms of, okay, so you know you've got to be consistent, but what are, you, what are you going to be consistent about? What are your major client challenges? What's your unique value proposition? And finally, what are the three to five key themes that your clients will respond to? And I would say putting those three to five key, thing, key themes up on the wall and every time you're thinking about, oh, what shall I write in my blog or on my LinkedIn post or on my podcast or whatever, on the little videos that I record, look at those themes. All of your content should be about those key themes. And it's either pain, what pain are the clients in, or gain, what can they gain by using your services or uh, solving that problem? Um, I think it's very much worth having a, a loose uh, plan of your content and you don't need to do stuff daily and then you know the stuff you the stuff you do daily you might you know you might choose something that's quite easy to do you send out an email or you put up a linkedin status or a tweet but again i wouldn't do all of them i'd do one of them whatever you do weekly it's a little bit more hefty what you do monthly it's heftier still and what you do yearly is going to be quite significant but 
you can cut down your work really significantly by reusing content and accumulating content. By reusing content, I mean that you use it in different forms. If you write a blog post, also do a video. If you do a video, do a do a short summary on LinkedIn. Um, if you you know if you do a LinkedIn summary, have a LinkedIn article in there. So reuse the material. People are very often worried that the content they put out on LinkedIn, they don't want to use it again. But LinkedIn will only ever send your content to five to ten percent of your of your audience of your network so the odds of the same people seeing it again are really quite low and even if they do it's not the end of the world so i'd recommend reusing and i would also recommend accumulating and if you do things daily and you find that there's some things that are particularly um useful or engage the audience or you get good feedback on then turn it into the weekly blog piece or the monthly blog piece um, and with that blog piece, maybe over a period of time, you could do 12 of them and turn it into an ebook. And maybe if you get two or three ebooks, turn it into a published book. So I would always say, you know, digital marketing seems like it can be so much work. But if you're intelligent about it and you plan it, then you can start at the end, start at the year and say, well, at the end of the year, what do I want? Do I want a report or an online course or an ebook? And how can every bit of content that I produce contribute to that? So that, I mean, the book, I, the book I'm I've just, well, I'm just about to publish, that's going to keep me in content for about five years. I mean, there's so many little snippets out of there that I, that I can use. Um, but I could have done it the other way around. You know, every little, every chapter, every chapter or even paragraph in that book could have been a LinkedIn status update in some ways. OK, right. So I went through that quite quickly. I got a bit scared about timing. I'm just going to check the, oh, right. I better get a move on. Okay, so we're, we're in a good place. We're using these things to find prospects and we're doing this with our content to make sure that we get good leads. The only thing I would say is that, and this is where the CRM system comes in useful, is that in order to build trust and educate people, you can't do it once. You need to do it over and over and over again. And if you do it via LinkedIn status updates or Facebook status updates or whatever, you're not, you know, the same people aren't going to see it. So you need to be consistent. And this is where the CRM system comes in. And a client relationship management system is really just an email and name database. And it stores it in one place and it allows you to automate emails or newsletters to people and it allows you to track your interactions with them. And that is incredibly powerful um, because over time it will allow you to build trust and educate and so that you're sending out a sequence or what they call a campaign of material to people. Um, in, in short, I'm going to show you how this works. Most people most people on here have a website and most of you now use social media. For the slightly more advanced ones might use social media to draw people back to their website. So they might put a summary of a blog post and then that will draw people back to the website, which is fantastic. But you can take this a stage further. You can have great content, a blog or a podcast or videos or whatever on your website that you post to social media that drags people back to the website. But in order for people to have access to it, you have some type of email capture. And this is what they call a, a lead magnet. This is great value content that allows you to capture someone's email. Once you've captured someone's email, you put it into the CRM system, something like MailChimp or ActiveCampaign, typically costs you between $10 and $50 a month, depending how many contacts you've got. And then that allows you to send out emails and newsletters that, again, will bring them back to your website so that they're accessing great content on your website. So it's, it's a really, I'm happy to do lots of questions about this, but it's a relatively simple system you can get someone to sort out your website, implement a system like this with email capture, with a CRM system, and sort out your website at the same time for about £1,500. Um, if you do it yourself, you can probably do it for about £200. It's not particularly difficult. Um, so in summary, um, a few to-dos. So these are questions to answer. In terms of your strategy, all your content should be about your client's challenges. Uh, what is your unique value proposition? How are you different from the content? 
And at the end of this, what are your three to five content themes that all of your digital content will be about? This is the most important thing to get right. If you get this wrong, then everything else will fail. Content execution, what is your content plan? How are you going to reuse and accumulate content to save yourself time? What is your high value lead magnet that you're gonna put on your website that you will exchange for people's emails? And also what is your subscription offer? So in order to get someone's email, <clears throat> you know, are you going to send them uh, a blog or a podcast every month? Well, you know, one really easy thing to do is just do 12 blogs. It's not that easy, but you know, if you can do 12 blogs, then you can send something, send someone one, you know, one piece a month for a year. And the great thing about a good CRM system is that you can see if people have opened your emails, if they visited the blog, how much time they spent reading the blog, etc. And finally, a content system. If you haven't got it already, get a cheap CRM system, input the emails you've already got, capture emails on your website and plan a 12 month subscription sequence, what people call a campaign um, to, to, to turn those prospects into leads. Um, and that is it. There's a lot more information I've put up on my own website, which is jeromani.com, but also some of you may be interested. We've recently launched a mini MBA in consulting at Consulting Masters, so you may be interested in that. But anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Sorry for talking quite quickly, um, but hopefully you've got a bit of value out of that. That was really great. Um, and we do have some questions, um, but before we launch into that, um, what I wanted to do was just turn, first of all, to Nick, our host, um, to just uh, talk a little bit about CMCE and other events that are coming up in the near future. Nick? Great. Thanks, Cosette. And thanks so much, Joe. Uh, always when uh, when I hear Joe talk, I think uh, funny I could kind of go back in time and take Joe with me to uh, <laughs> you know, three or four years ago when I was setting up a consultancy from scratch. Uh, it's not well. It's not around with me in it. It's still it's still going in some shape or form. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, so anyway, uh, great to see so many people on this call. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Centre of, of Management Consulting Excellence uh, and are wondering uh, where is it in London and can I visit it? It's not quite like that. Uh, we're a, a voluntary and largely virtual community of people who are interested in uh, consulting, not surprisingly, and uh, sharing and kind of understanding leading and emerging practice in that area. So we organize events like this, but we are also growing the amount of collaboration uh, amongst people uh, within the network who want to share. Uh, the best way to access that is to uh, sign up for our newsletter. Um, there is a system of uh, capturing you when you book for one of these things and adding you to, you to our database, but that does actually take rather longer than we uh, would like you to. So I'll post the link to the, uh, the sign up form um, in the chat later on. Um, anyway, so that's the uh, that's the advert. Uh, things that are coming up in the next couple of months are quite exciting. Um, firstly, uh, we have on the 11th of November our very own uh, CMC Research Awards. Uh, this will be the third year we've run these. They are the world's, I think, the world's only uh, awards for research into management consulting because uh, it's a big industry and surprisingly not that many people um, examine it and those that do uh, win uh, one of our uh, magnificent prizes. Uh, part of the magnificent prize is the ability to run a uh, uh, session like the one that Joe is running at the moment because he was a prize winner uh, last year so um, that's that's how great it can be. Um, so we're very much looking forward to that. Um, then following that uh, Luca Kalina uh, who you can see somewhere on the screen uh, will be running a session on virtual consulting, um, which we are also very excited about. And then rolling into next year, we will be having a panel session on the effective use of associates, uh, drawing from within the CMC membership and elsewhere, both people who've worked effectively as associates and uh, firms that have worked effectively by hiring them. So that promises again to be a, a practical session, particularly for those of uh, people who are in freelance space and want to know how to um, how best to kind of put themselves around uh, effectively for uh, being an associate. Uh, and then sometime in February, I think it's going to be towards the end, we'll have again an, another 
uh, prize winner from last year's research awards will be delivering a session on consulting and ethics. Um, we're also setting up a, a session on intangible value as well, which is uh, another topic that I think consultants could do with knowing a little bit more about. And that one will be coming out not only via Zoom, but also through Clubhouse. So we're starting to experiment with new media for uh, uh, collaborating and um, talking about leading an emerging practice. Uh, so there will be more about the program uh, for future, which I will talk about, I suspect, at our awards ceremony on the 11th. So uh, more details of that in the newsletter, and I hope to see some of you there soon. Um, so meanwhile, thanks for that, and back to Cassette. Thank you, Nick. Well, we've got quite a bit to look forward to towards the end of the year and early next year. That's really great to hear about all of those diverse activities from, uh, from people who are here and, and others who are going to join us in the future. Thank you, Nick. So Joe, get ready. We've got some questions okay, for you. Good. <laughs> so here's the first one. Um, these days, how much consulting business is sourced initially through digital marketing versus how much is won through non-digital channels? Do you have a rough percentage? Um, most de deals, however sourced, are usually agreed on face to face, but do you have a rough percentage about that? Yeah. So, so the, the the key thing here is digital marketing won't get you any sales, um, and and that's really important to bear in mind. You still have to do uh, the face to face or or the Zoom at least, and digital marketing will take you to that. Will will you know? If you imagine the funnel of, you know, going all the way from people who don't know about you, who are oblivious to you, to people who know something about you, to those that have been in a relationship, a digital relationship with you some time and, you know, have seen your content and know what you do. So you are a visible expert to them. That funnel is really leaky. Um, so. I would say 100 percent of sales still come through face to face contact and all the rest of it. But it's that top bit of the funnel It's getting you. You're, you're never going to make a sale or you're very rarely going to make a sale on, on digital content alone. But it, it's, it's filling that early part of the funnel. So I can't it would be wrong to give a percentage um, on either side of that because it's well, it's 100 percent at the at the uh, tip of the cone. Um, but up here, it depends on the consultancies that use it. You know, a lot of consultancies st are still working on you know, testimonials and referrals because they're the most effective form of getting clients. Um, and, and some of them do it very effectively, uh, but, but they're, they're, it's not right to compare marketing with conversion or attraction with conversion, marketing with, with sales. They're very different things. Now that's really helpful, that contrast between marketing and sales. Thank you very much. Um, another question for you. Um, I'm surprised a lead mechanism not mentioned is the use of a white paper. Yes. Do you believe white papers have any value? For yes. example, I'm creating one on using AI to improve sales performance, as I believe it answers prospect problems. And can I actually use it for specific email capture? Yeah, yeah, def definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I kind of, I kind of, in my head, I kind of merged blogs and white papers, and they're not the same thing. And you're completely right to raise it. White papers are very effective. Um, I would say, in addition to that, um, it's worth taking the content out of the white paper and creating a blog around it, so that you get the SEO from it. The thing is, most white papers are in the form of PDFs. PDFs are in effect invisible um, to search engines, and if you can take the content out and put it in a blog post as well. Um, and also, you know, record a little video on it and post that to LinkedIn and then have a link back to your website to download it. And then for the you might want to call it something like a research report rather than a white paper, um, if, it, if it contains research so that, you know, it, it's seen as something that's quite valuable and useful. And certainly anything with AI in it at the moment is seen as high value um, and it's a very common search term. So I. You know, if you, if you were looking for something to use as a lead magnet, I think that would be a great thing to offer. That's really great. Thanks, Joe. Um, here's another one for you. I was wondering what your view is, re-LinkedIn, 
and whether it is saturated with bad marketing content that turns prospects off from using it. I know yeah. how I feel about that. What's your view? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. But I have completely changed my mind on LinkedIn uh, completely. So I, for, for 10, 10 years, I really couldn't see the point in LinkedIn. I thought it was the most overvalued thing in the world. And there's so much bad marketing and content out there. But clients are still on there. Um, and a lot of clients are active and you can see how active people are. And when you're doing searches, you can search just for active people. So it's one of the search criteria is when someone was last active on LinkedIn. And, you know, you can exclude people from searches that don't have photos. So you can exclude people who aren't uh, inactive. So I, the key thing here is I used to think of LinkedIn as a big group of people. And if you think of it like that, um, and you think of all that, those, that bad marketing, it's, it, it is a confusing place, but it's actually a whole, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of different communities. Um, and they participate in different ways. And the key thing to remember is that no matter what you put out on LinkedIn, you're never going to get 20% of your networks, unless you've got 20 people in your network, you're not going to get 20 percent of your network seeing it you're probably not even going to get five percent of your network seeing it and so i did, clients don't leave it because it's a because of the bad content the key thing for you is to make sure you have good content is that the, the you provide consistent high quality value um in anything you put out there um even even if it's even if it's automated you know do personalized high quality value content so I'm 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 a, I'm a great believer in in LinkedIn now. I've kind of flipped completely on my view. And that's oh. that's a really interesting answer. And, and and one one thing to say is that and this is for all of you that are thinking of buying or or doing you know doing a bit more on digital marketing. Most of the digital marketing advice out there comes from the states, and you will notice this because a lot of these websites look the same. And a lot of the sales process is the same. And this, this lead, so uh, if you look at American CEOs, they're predominantly marketing CEOs, so CEOs with a marketing background. If you look at the UK, they're very often finance or accounting CEOs. And there's a big difference in culture. And American, and it's taken me a while to realize this, American sales techniques don't, archetypal American sales techniques don't work well in the UK. Um, in, in the US and, the, and Australia, you see a lot of content that says scale your business to 12 figures a month uh, in, in six months or less. Or, you know, uh, download this free ebook worth $5,000. It just simply doesn't work. We're much more cynical and reticent uh, than, than the US audience. And so I would encourage you not to, there's lots of people that sell this stuff online, Sam Ovens and a few others. Um, I'd advise you not to follow their copy to write, you know, high quality content for your audience, which for most of you will be a British audience. And just to build on the content point, um, another question here, where do you stand on the type of newsletter? You know, what cuts through the blizzard of all, everything that's out there today? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's got it's got the, the messaging the messaging is so important there's so much bad messaging out there if you really spend a day getting into the heads of your clients and speak to your clients and you know really understand their problems and not just their problems but how it makes them feel and what the consequences of not dealing with those problems are and this is why i went right back to the beginning and said it's all about the niche and the messaging and understanding the psychology and that should be the basis for your marketing content. And if you're genuinely writing high value content that helps your clients either better understand their problem or helps them solve their problems, you know, giving them templates or guidelines or five things they should do or three things they should look at or whatever, or simply reposting other articles that you've found, People will subscribe. People will follow you. People will see you as a visible expert. If your content's going to other people, then they'll just ignore it. They'll put you in the spam folder. That's fine. You don't need to worry about them. But getting that messaging, the high value messaging right, is absolutely crucial on your website, 
your social media and any content you put out. And it's really worth spending time thinking about, you know, I had that three lev levels, you know, what's your unique value proposition? What's your niche and what are your content themes? Really worth thinking about that in detail. That's really interesting. I have a couple more questions for you. I want to lead with one that, that segues quite, quite nicely with what you were just talking about. I know some consultants, particularly in the coaching and consulting space, who run Instagram and Facebook alongside LinkedIn, often with the same content. Are they wasting their time, diluting their message? Um, so I know these people. I don't know your specific people, but I you know, um, I think if you're a, a nutritionist coach in California, um, then Facebook and Instagram is a great way to go. Um, I think if you can uh, automate cross posting from LinkedIn to other platforms without it looking ridiculous, then why not? It doesn't cost you any any time and effort. But coaching is very different. It's a very different audience to consultancy typically. Um, you're, you're tip, as a coach, you're typically looking at the person and only the person. You're not talking about the organization. You're focusing on the individual. Um, and that's why if you're focusing on the individual, Facebook can work and, and, uh, and Instagram can work. And, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, it, that, you know, Martin, who is a business partner of mine, has been doing, he's been doing, you know, digital marketing for 20 years we're having an argument at the moment. He wants us to advertise Consulting Mastered on Facebook. And when people are on Facebook, they're thinking of family and friends, in my view. They're not thinking of business. When you're on LinkedIn, you're thinking of business. You're in that mindset. It's more expensive than Facebook advertising. It's about three times as expensive. But the leads you get, in my view, are much higher quality. So I wouldn't say they're necessarily wasting their money. But pay-per-click is one of the fastest ways you will ever burn through money. I would try everything else before you start using pay-per-click. Thank you very much for that. That's really helpful. Um, so I have another uh, question for you. This one uh, is going to shift the subject a bit. And this one's about uh, email permission. What's a pragmatic policy for either finding and sending cold email first, second, third contact, under legitimate interest yeah. versus a permission-based informed consent approach? Yeah, I mean, I my, my view on this, if you're a small firm, is that it's better to ask forgiveness rather than permission. Um, uh, GDPR um, accepted and all the rest of it, and my, my secretary is always telling me off for this, but um, uh, where I do, I, I get my, well, two things. Firstly, when I do an automation, or I get an email list, or I get a LinkedIn automation going, my targets are so precisely defined that I'd be really surprised if it wasn't useful to them. And I don't try and hard sell. There's no point trying to sell before you've built trust and built familiarity and all the rest of it. There's no point messaging someone on LinkedIn and saying, can we have a call? You know, I've, I've got this wonderful product. I mean, so you know, it's like having going up to someone in the street and asking them for a date. It's not going to happen. You need to build. You need to see them a few times. You need to go for a coffee. You need to provide, get them to see you doing something right rather than jump straight in. So, um, yeah. So my, my, my. <laughs> I've forgotten the question. Email permission, legitimate yeah, yeah. interest so, so, versus so, informed so, consent. So yeah, thank you. Sorry. So it's, it's I've got two little boys and they wipe your brain out at this time of night. Um, I would I would generally say um, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. And the other thing I was going to say is that at the at the end of every email automation that you send out, uh, Mailchimp or Active Campaign have an unsubscribe button. If people don't like the value that you're giving them, they'll click unsubscribe. Then they button. can. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, okay, that's great. Listen, that was the last question that I had for you. So I think uh, we can we can just uh, close now. Any last uh, concluding remarks, Joe, from you? No, just thank you and sorry for my for, for my brain lapse. Then my my I, uh, as you all, many of you all know, when you have little children, you don't necessarily get a lot of sleep. But thank you so much for staying on, having the time to listen to me. I, I hope it was useful.